Welcome to our episode of Biblical Archaeology, From the Ground Down. Presented by Bible Interact and hosted by Dr. George Sparks. Join us as we explore the fascinating world of the Bible from leading experts in the field of archaeology. Hello everyone, I'm Dr. David Graves, an experienced Biblical archaeologist and CEO of Electronic Christian Media. I'm here today with another exciting episode on our Archaeology Discoveries channel, where we discuss important archaeological artifacts related to the Bible. Thanks for watching, and be sure to like and subscribe to our channel. Well, welcome. My name is Dr. George Sparks. I'm the host of Biblical Archaeology from the Ground Down. And my special guest today is Dr. David Graves, PhD from Aberdeen University. Our topic today is going to be Jericho. And to tell you the truth about Jericho, when I ask different scholars, I get different answers. And some just want to avoid it altogether because it's so difficult, because there's so many opinions. But today, I'm not going to say we have the answers, but I, I believe it's going to be fun. I believe Dr. Graves has a PowerPoint and he's going to give some opinions. And then I got some pottery we can share when we describe the pottery that is found associated with the excavations. And then also some of the latest reports by um, Professor Lorenzo Nigro. I have it all actually on my phone. So uh, it's small print, but we'll work with that. It's the latest report. What he says after 18 years, I believe it was 1997 to like 1915, so 18 years of excavation. So we got a number of different types of resources that we're going to share with you. So, Dr. Graves, welcome to the program. Good to be with you, George, and, as always. Absolutely. And uh, just to let the list of the audience know that 13th on the month, Friday the 13th is it's not always an un unlucky day because on Friday the 13th, uh, Biblical or Bible Interact just hit 100,000 subscribers. So that was pretty exciting, even though it was on the 13th. But I thank everybody for subscribing, and we're just going to keep on finding more people to be on the program uh, and make it more and more interesting. Dr. Graves, you want to put up your PowerPoint and share with us? Yeah, we'll get started. By the way, behind you is a nice picture of Tell Jericho where you can see the different walls. Yeah, it's right there behind me. And, and yeah. Some of them, uh, it's sort of from a, from a distance, it gives you a better uh, aerial overview of it. It's, a, uh, it's kind of an interesting spot. I've been there a number of times. Now, Jericho is actually what we would call in territory wise west bank isn't isn't it it's, uh yeah it's in palestinian territory it's down on the uh it's down on the in the jordan valley uh when you come down from jerusalem and you want to head over to the crossing into jordan at the the name of the crossing just of the uh, it's it's a different name uh king hussein bridge on mm -hmm. the Allenby Bridge. There you go. I was getting ready to see Allenby where they just had problems the other day. Yeah, there was yeah. A, some shootings there. So uh, that's the one you would cross. I've been over it a few times, many times, actually. Um, so if you're coming from Jerusalem, going toward the Allenby Bridge on the, on the Israeli side, it's called Allenby. On the other side, it's called uh, King Hussein. It's on the left-hand side. You take a road to the left uh, down in the Jordan Valley and you'll come to it. Uh, you can actually see it from Tel El Hamam on the other side where we were excavating and stand up there. I'll show some photos of that in, in a moment. So we're going to talk about the conquest of Jericho. And we know the biblical account and the walls came tumbling down. Here I am holding a large mud brick from the, from the site when we were visiting it one year. So to put things into perspective geographically, Tel El Hamam there, Sodom, uh, during the late Bronze period, the time of Moses, it was called Abel Shatin because Sodom had been destroyed 
and nothing existed in the uh, in the in that spot. So Sodom was gone. Uh, nobody was living there. In fact, Moses in the text says that when they came through, um, basically nobody was home. It was a um, sort of a barren area, but they called it Abel Shatim. That is the um, the area of the acacia trees and the acacias grow right around that spot. So a perfect area in front of the tell for the Israelites to camp out. And then of course there is Tel Hamam, but for Jericho right across on the other side of the Jordan River. And if you stand on the Acropolis up here at Tel Hamam right there. If you stand there, you can clearly look across the valley on a clear day and see Jericho in the distance. Many a day I would stand up and look across and see it. Here is a, a picture behind me, blown up. See some of the excavations that they've done here. This cut in the side was done by, um, by Kenyon, I believe. See some of the walls here going around and uh, this is the pathway up to look around the site today. Something that most people don't realize is that there is also a New Testament Jericho. Herod's northern palace is there, in the Wadi Kelt. And so this is the area right here that is the New Testament Jericho. Uh, the Old Testament Jericho we just showed you is actually about a mile away here at, uh, on the sort of the edge of the modern city of, of Jericho. There's the road that I was talking about you take down to, um, to see it. Uh, here's an aerial shot of it. You can see there's the tell right there all dug into different, different areas, a little village around it. Historically, in the 19... Hundreds, Astro-German expedition by Sellen and Wassinger. They claim that Jericho during the late Bronze period from 1550 to 1200 BC. That's generally the time that the Israelites first appeared in Canaan um, by most scholars. And this is prior to the development of pottery chronology, incidentally, as well. So um, pottery was important. So they made the claim, uh, it had been picked up by Garstang in the 1930s, um, wanting to dig there. And so his claims are a bit different. He said the fourth city was destroyed by Joshua just after 1400 BC. There's John Garstang there pointing Here's a photograph of him from his excavations, the 1930s. Notice the old vehicles all parked down here on that road. And city four was destroyed in a violent conflagration in the late 15th to early 14th century BC, he claimed. And he based that now on the pottery from the destruction and the scarabs that he'd found in the tomb and also in the absence of Mycenaean ware. The Mycenaeans had a distinctive kind of pottery. Well, perhaps George, you'll show us a piece of that later if you have one. If you're nice. If I'm nice, good. <laughs> I'll try to be. So John Garstang uh, found three scarabs and a seal. Here they are depicted here. Um, they all date to the late Bronze period, 1550 to 1200. That Moses the third, Amenhotep the third, that Moses the third, and Hatshepsut, uh, and that's we know that because that's their names in the cartouche on the seals. So it's pretty, uh, pretty cut and dried. So did somebody come walking through and drop it? Uh, we don't know how they got there, but uh, we find four of them, so we know that it was a, a active during those periods. And Garstang says, in a word, in all material details and in the date of the fall of Jericho, took place as described in the biblical narrative. 
Our demonstration is limited, however, to material observations. The walls fell suddenly, apparently by earthquake, he claims, and the cities were destroyed by fire about 1400 BC. These are the basic facts resulting from our investigations. The link with Joshua and the Israelites is only circumstantial, but it seems to be solid and without a flaw. So that was his claim in the 30s. That's from his book on it. Well, along comes Dame Kathleen Kenyon in the 1950s. And uh, at that time, Garstang had asked Kathleen Kenyon to review and update his findings, do a little more work. And Jericho was destroyed, she claimed, at the middle, at the end of the uh, mid Bronze Age in 1550. That's mid 16th century and unoccupied, she claimed, throughout the late Bronze Age, 1400 BC. Now, she never published a definitive study of Jericho's pottery herself as the basis for her conclusion. However, her editor, one of her managers later on, after she had died, did publish some of those. And Kay Prague, who, whom I know, uh, who have had interactions with on Tel El Hamam and live presently uh, republishing some of her material from her work in, J in Jerusalem. Here she is here. And Kenyon claimed, it's a sad fact that of the town walls of the late Bronze Age, within which period the attack by the Israelites must fall by any dating not a trace remains. The excavation of Jericho, therefore, has thrown no light on the walls of Jericho, of which the destruction is so vividly described in the book of Joshua. So here we have uh, one archaeologist, Garstang, who dug there, claiming it does connect to uh, Jericho, does connect to Joshua's time. And now we have Dean Kathleen Kenyon, who uh, claims that it doesn't. A uh, dame, incidentally, is, is equivalent to the um, the knighting of a man as a sir, and a female is knighted as a dame. Uh, that's how important her work was, considered by the British at the time. However, there are some deficiencies in Kenyon's work, and that was the publishing of her finds. The only thing that she published while she was living at that time was the popular book, Digging Up Jericho, where she describes in 1957 um, some of her work there and some of the spectacular things that she had found. But the field work remained unpublished for 35 years. And as I said, her editor, uh, Holland, Dr. Holland, published uh, her work in 19. 81 and 83. And Holland was actually a professor at the University of Toronto that uh, Bryant Wood studied under when he did his PhD uh, work in the 1970s and the 1980s uh, in Toronto. That's where I met him when I was doing my undergraduate work in Toronto. I met uh, Bryant Wood. So he got his material and his information directly from uh, Kathleen Kenyon's editor. And he challenges her finds based on the pottery that she didn't publish, but had later been published by his professor, Dr. Holland. And she claimed her conclusions based on the absence of the late Bronze Age Cypriot ware. Show it what it looked like. And she said, there wasn't any of that. And she expected to see that because they would have been trading with the people at the time. So uh, basically she makes her arguments on the basis of negative evidence, argument from silence. However, she did find a lot of late Bronze Age pottery 
And here are some samples of that from her book. Um, and dates to 1450 to 1400 BC. And Bryant Wood says the late bronze one pottery that Garstan had excavated, that this was precisely the period that Kenyon repeatedly said was absent at Jericho. So the pottery that she did find, um, she makes a different argument. Now, Bryant Wood is a trained archaeologist, but he'd never excavated at Jericho's uh, itself. So he's he's basing his conclusions on what Kathleen Kenyon had found during her excavations, uh, but neglected to use in the dating of the site. And so Kenyon's analysis was based on what was not found at Jericho rather than what was found. Here's a couple of pieces of uh, Bryant Wood had drawn in what the uh, pieces of pottery would have looked like, late bronze pottery. It's called bichrome ware. Now this is trench number one that Kenyon excavated, middle bronze two, 181650. Um, there's number two layer, there's a Cyprian, uh, Silopian wall destroyed in 1500 BC. And number three down here, this is a photo that I took while I was there. Uh, number three down here is the house built outside building A1 against the eastern wall side of the tower. You see the mud brick here, clear mud brick here, and you see the stone kind of um, building structure here. And this is one of the V-shaped um, trenches that they put through the wall. So again, we find different periods based on the different areas and also the different kind of structures that are are made. Now, John Garstang, he uncovered some Philistine bichrome pottery. Here's the piece that uh, Bryant Wood had redrawn here. And it's clearly a late bronze marker because this kind of pottery um, was only used in the 15th century BC. This is from 1450 to 1400 BC. Found a lot of this, but she was silent on it. And that's not acceptable for an archeologist. Here's a colorized photo I did of um, Garstang. It wasn't black and white, I just colorized it. And it's published in my book on the history of biblical archeology. span now, Bryant then uncovers Kenyon's unsound methodology. Again, there's the bichrome ware, some of the pottery that uh, was found there. There's a Canaanite bichrome piece of pottery from Beth Shemesh, late bronze one. Some more of it from Megiddo. I think you've got a couple of pieces as well. You'll show us later there, or do you want to show those now? So here we have the... Um, the evidence that Bryant would have discovered. First of all, the city was strongly fortified in the late Bronze One period, the time of the, con the conquest, according to biblical chronology. Um, the model of it here shows its reconstruction and how it had two walls, an interior wall and an exterior wall, and uh, both had been collapsed. The city was, um, was massively destroyed by fire. This is the uh, Jericho tomb in the British Museum. You can see the char, the burns area material from the uh, excavations. Overall, the carbon dating from the grain found in the destruction of Jericho ranged from as high as 1883 to as low as 1262. That's a range of over 1,600 years. So one must rely on the pottery identification and the scarabs to do the dating. The fortification walls collapsed at the time that the city was destroyed, possibly by an earthquake activity as God command. Here's uh, Bryant Wood showing some of that evidence there, the mud, break, mud bricks that had collapsed, how they had fallen, and they fell outward, not inward like most destructions and evidence of that double wall. 
Here's the revetment wall, the black. And then we'd have the mud brick up here for the lower mud brick wall, the fallen mud brick outward, and then the mud brick for the upper wall, or the inner wall here, which we call it upper because it's higher. And that's how the uh, city would be reconstructed. There's a drawing that a friend of uh, Brian Wood had done, Beckler. Well, actually, I actually have a copy of that. I have it hanging in my frame to my wall. But you can see the exterior walls had cracked and f had fallen outward, collapsed. And of course, they could easily walk up the ramp into the city and have access to it. And here is uh, Rahab's house, perhaps on the uh, wall. We had we had uh, rooms or, or, or buildings built up against the wall. Very common practice in antiquity. There's one of the mud bricks right there. They're, they were huge. I guess that's what surprised me the most is how large they were. And uh, there's a, a photo of them all laid out. So the destruction occurred at first time as well in the spring is indicated by the large quantities of grain stored in the room in the city here. There's a photo of some of the grain storage jars uh, full of grain. Here's a close-up of one by Todd Bolin. And these remain, even today, I was able to see them as I was walking around. Here's a photograph found during Garstang's excavations full of grain. So it wasn't consumed and it wasn't taken. The other uh, issue is that during war, if you conquered a city, you would take the grain because that's just like money, like entering your vault and stealing all the money. You don't leave it behind. You don't burn it. But remember, God commanded that everything should be burned. So contrary to what was customary, the grain was not plundered or taken by the citizens in accordance to the command that was given by Moses. Um, they were to burn the city. And the word that's used in Hebrew is actually quite interesting. It's, it's the word in Hebrew called harim. A harim is a, a ban, a devotee, uh, exterminate, most often of devoting to destructions of cities, of Canaanites and other neighbors of the is Israelites. Exterminating inhabitants and destroying or uh, appropriating their possessions. Uh, our English Bibles uh, speak of this as being put under the ban, but it's actually being put under the curse. And so they were to exterminate or annihilate the people that lived in, in Jericho as a burnt offering to God. And so that's how it would be understood in antiquity. So that's the word there, harim, the curse. They were placed under the curse. And so it was the uh, curse pronounced on the people as a result of sin and thus understood as a form of punishment uh, within the uh, Torah or the Old Testament. Seventh, Jericho lay abandoned for a period of time following the destruction in accordance with Joshua's curse, Joshua 6, 26. That's what we find in the archeological record. Now here are some more photographs of the revetment wall. Uh, some of the Canaanite weapons that they would have used the mace and the kopish, the sickle sword, and the duckbill axe. We've mentioned these again, I think, previously. I just give you weapons that were used. Now, as we come to Lorenzo Nigro, he uh, is an Italian. He dug there for many years, as, as George had mentioned. And he conducted excavations from 19... 97 to around 2000, um, three years. He actually did a little bit more uh, recently. And since 2009, um, 
was resumed by the, the university and the Palestinian Motadak under the direction of Lorenzo Nigro and Hamad Taha. Now he uses similar dates and dating system to Kenyon, uh, not John Garstang, which is kind of interesting. So he stayed with the traditional. Here's one of the articles that he has written. And he quotes, <clears throat> in spite of the extra effort devoted to the city defenses, Middle Bronze Three Jericho was destined to suffer a dramatic destruction around 1550 BC. Damage was particularly evident in the so-called palace storerooms, which were covered by a thick ash layer of ash and bore several signs of a conflagration. That's according to what uh, Garstang found. He just dates it to a different time period. He says, after this destruction, Jericho was abandoned for more than a century until the beginning of the late Bronze II, around 1400 BC, when a new smaller settlement was established on the site. So that's his interpretation um, of what he found. And Bryant Wood uh, recently has said, all the evidence from the earlier digs has disappeared over time. Of course, that makes it difficult to confirm things. We only have records, drawings, and photos. But the Italian uncovered a completely new section of the wall, which, he, which we did not know still existed. Confirms the destruction of the walls falling outward, not like other sites that fall inward. Unfortunately, they followed Kenyon's dating of the site. And so that just puts everything into a bit of a conundrum and just confuses the matters uh, between all the archeologists. So the minimalists use one dating, the maximalists use another dating. And uh, until they get their dating all straightened out, uh, we still have a bit of a conundrum. So that's where I'll leave it for now. It's kind of interesting what they found and certainly some of the evidence that has, has been found in the past uh, has been basically sort of glossed over or neglected by some of the present archaeologists. So, you know, who's who? One uh, thing I thought was interesting when we're showing this pottery and, and some of those locations such as the um, the amphoras that were broken open that had the grain. Yeah. Of course, yeah. even the discussion that I had with Jody Magnus when it came to carbon-14 dating, she kind of like shook her head said it, it, it could be such a variant in carbon-14 dating dating because you can also have a plus and a minus right yeah. plus 50 years minus 50 years or whatever which could actually throw it into when when the debate can be so refined especially with jericho yeah now well, I, mu the, I must say ahead. george that on this carbon-14 dating issue that we have what we call um, long-lived and short-lived carbon dating. So long-lived is something like a piece of wood. You got a tree, it could be cut down, you know, a uh, hundred years ago. And so then it burns. So that throws your dating off. But when you have, pot, when you have um, grain, that's what we call short-lived because it's the year that it was harvested that you have the grain because it doesn't survive for long longer than that. So that's much more refined. When you do carbon dating on grain, you get a, a closer date than you do if you have wood when you would have a, a wider date. So this mm -hmm. is the best kind of carbon dating you could you could have. But as uh, I pointed out, there was, still was a wide range in the dates um, given for that carbon dating of the, of the yeah. grain. Well, right. And what I was getting at is Let's say that um, um, my bias is towards an early date for the Exodus, which yes. would throw the conquest at a different date too, would it not? Yes. So, so therefore, my conquest of Jericho has to be earlier than somebody that has a late date. Now, if I was going to use a carbon-14 dating to try to prove a point, 
and there's a variant in that carbon dating, I could use that plus and minus to actually swing it my way because a difference of 50 years or could actually put you into a late Bronze Age 1 or late Bronze Age 2A versus 2B, which the general public wouldn't be aware of. That's just too refined, especially for kind of what we're doing now. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of a lot of angles to try to make Jericho what I want to say, fit. I'll even say it myself to fit my bias. We all have bias. I'll say I got a bias. Let me say that my bias is going to be an early date. I mean, a late date. So how am I going to make Jericho fit my late date of 1260? Not that it is. I'm just using that as the antecedent for the early date. <laughs> and George, but, what's important, yes. you know, what's important to point out is that both sides have their biases. And that fits into how they interpret the data. So uh, what we're looking at is something that's fairly uh, objective in the pottery, that we can mm -hmm. look at the pottery or the scarabs and uh, we can pinpoint the dating uh, more objectively, uh, but even that is subject to somewhat of an interpretation. Oh, but it sure but again, be. both interpret that data, the early date and the late date with a bias. And we must never forget that when we're looking at, uh, we're looking at this material. Um, well, you got the late date, you got early date, and you got those to say it's it's fiction. Yeah. And Nigro is on the minimalist side. Uh, he doesn't like the Bible's account, so he, he downplays that. Uh, mm -hmm. he, he actually fiddles with the dating, um, deciding with Kenyon. She had her biases as well. And then, of okay. course... Bryant Wood has his biases on the other side, um, being a maximalist and, and uh, arguing for the uh, for the early date. So this all fits into how Jericho is interpreted, and it just muddies the waters, in my opinion. It makes it difficult. Well, it does, you know. <laughs> well in all fairness to uh, Lorenzo Nigro, uh, you know, I pulled up his report for Jericho. We talked about this earlier, so it's not yeah. like surprise, surprise, right? You know, I was looking at it. And let's say if I started to read it, and look at this, people, it's small print. And my age is, my eyes don't work with the small print, but we'll get to this in a second. With all this pottery that they're showing these fragments and whatnot. Yes. Um, what I was surprised, where are the oil lamps? Because the oil lamps are the most common of pottery in the ancient world. Because everybody's got lamps. And lamps were cheaply made. It's like making a bowl and then pinching it on one side. So I think maybe you showed one oil lamp in there that was late bronze, but we can determine not not zero it in, but we can tell a middle bronze age lamp from a late bronze age lamp. And then we look yes. at, you were talking about something they were looking at, but didn't find. So they made their conclusions on things that they didn't find and it was late Bronze Age. You said, was it my Mycenaean my, ware? Mycenaean ware, yeah. Okay, well, okay. So let me work on this a little bit here. Ah, there we go. Mycenaean ware. Uh, this is called a Pyxis. And this is not imitation made local. This is actually Mycenaean ware, which is kind of, you can identify it because of Number one, the, the Pyxis shows up in the late Bronze Age. And we date Mycenaean work. I think it's more fine-tuned because it was found in Tel El Armarna, the short-lived city built by Akhenaten. And that's where archaeologists kind of date this in a way um, because they found it El, at El Armarna. And it dates to what? Around 13, 1340, maybe 1360, 1320. About the time period, let me make it easy for people. King Tut and King Tut's dad, and maybe King Tut's grandfather. Maybe that time in the in the uh, 13th century. And George, so, it's, also, it's also made famous from the Amarna letters. Tablets. And the Amarna letters, yes. Tablets. So very true. The Amarna letters, and those were letters that were written from the Canaanite city states that 
were accidentally found at Tal El Armana, where they were looking at this style of pottery as well. They couldn't find it, but some of the um, Jericho was more inland, and sometimes you don't find pottery that is along the coast, coastal trade further inland. That doesn't mean that's the rule, by no means. But that was one explanation of why they didn't find it. But that doesn't mean the city didn't exist at this particular time, because also we have different types of late Bronze Age pottery as well from another culture, right? And so they have to go to other um, evidence to date it. So they look at the scarabs and they look at what they did find. And that is the pottery that is uh, the bichrome ware. Uh, you've bichrome, got another separate, yeah. another separate piece there, I think. Yeah, the, the Cypriot. Now, we did mention Cypriot ware, but the, the Cypriot ware is another uh, pottery, this particular style called the bilbil. It comes in different shapes and sizes, yeah. but this one was small and it was easy to handle. So that's the one I pulled out of the shelf. You can see it's called ring base ware. It has a ring on the bottom. It's got a really cool style to it, easily identified as the late Bronze Age, probably around late Bronze Age two period. I didn't see any of this. Nobody mentioned this either. No. Cypriot ware, which is very popular in the late Bronze Age. Okay, these are good indications of what time period you're at as well. I'm going to label that right there. I'm trying not to break anything. Okay, you know what? Then I mentioned the Pyxis, right? Mycenaean Pyxis. You've seen that. Mycenaean. And then you mentioned bichrome. So here's the Canaanite bichrome. Imitation made local of the Pyxis. Right there. And there's your bichrome one. Yeah. So you can have bichrome wear and also have it identifying because it'd be what we mean by imitation. Let me give it a modern day term, a knockoff. Let's say if I had Oakley glasses and I want to get them for like 10 bucks instead of 150, I buy the knockoff. Well, this is the early rendition of the, the knockoff. <laughs> so they got Mycenaean wear, but they also have the imitations because it was a popular style. But it has that bichrome, meaning two, like bicycle, two wheels, by more than one color. Here they got, it looks like a kind of a dark red and then a, a brown. On a, on a white slip, but the slip is dirty, right? It's it's, in the, it's been in the soil. Here's one, and here you can see the white slip. It's there. You go, another form of bichrome yeah. wear. Yeah, and this is what Dr. Grace was talking about. Easily identified Canaanite, late Bronze Age, but they also have late Bronze Age. There's no rule to this. You can have late Bronze Age in the Middle Bronze Age. You can have late, you can have bichrome also in the Iron Age. There's nobody to say that, hey, this is the late Bronze Age, so no, you can't make it bichrome. So I've seen pieces from outside of the late Bronze Age that were still bichrome. And if I just had a fragment of it, that would be confusing. Now, you got to need more than sometimes just a fragment. At least I'm not that good. I'll, I'll just say I'm not that good. I like to, like to work with museum items, whole. And intact. I'm very spoiled over here, right? Yeah, <laughs> you are. Like God, just admit it. Why don't you? No, yeah. George, you're not spoiled. No, you're not like that at all. And then we got this. It's it's a style of pottery which we didn't mention. And it's kind of like the pottery that. Oh, what do you want? To put it? It's the pottery that it happens. I call it transition. Transition where it doesn't really trans. It's a, not a transition of pottery. It's a transition of our dating, what we call Middle Bronze Age to the Late Bronze Age. But still, we see the pottery in both sides because there's no way you say, hey, look what time it is. This Late Bronze Age, you can no longer make that anymore. That doesn't happen either. Right. Yeah. So at the beginning of the Late Bronze Age periods where we got destruction levels, we can also see Middle Bronze Age pottery. In the, such as your uh, Ixos pottery yeah. with a stipple potters, pattern on it. Potters didn't wake up, you know, New Year's morning and say, I'm going to make a totally different piece of pottery this year because we're in a new year and, and I can't make any of that old stuff anymore. There's always a transition uh, with the pottery and there's an evolution of it that, that the, uh, 
the potters would uh, say, well, I can improve, you know, this by doing this. And, and so just a gradual change that we find. So that has to mm -hmm. be taken into consideration as well. Uh, that does affect our dating. But, but again, as you've pointed out, the pieces of pottery are very well uh, identifiable in the different time periods, with the uh, forms and structure documented, well documented. Uh, okay. from many, many different sites. And then, of course, we can date it because we find the scarabs uh, has the name of the pharaoh on it. Uh, we know exactly when um, this stuff was being used. All right. So here we got, this is called uh, amphorisco. So it's like a small amphora. That's a nice piece. Yeah, this is actually what we call chocolate on whiteware. This yeah. is that transitional piece between Middle Bronze Age and the MB3 to LB1. You can find this right here. This is what I read. This is what I see in some photos. A nice intact piece. Now, understand that this is not how it's found at a dig. More often than not, you're finding fragments. That's right. So uh, when you see intact pieces like this, they usually come from tombs. And the tomb protected the pottery. And that's right. why it's intact. And we tell El Hamam, uh, we excavated a uh, early bronze, middle bronze a dolmen, which is a like a tomb. Uh, uh -huh. It's actually more of a not so much they didn't bury people there. It was more of a family um, memorial. But we excavated, I think it was fifteen whole pieces of pottery found in that dolmen. And it was one of the thousands on the site that had been undisturbed by uh, by modern folk. Oh, you're dampening it down. Yeah, that helps with the. Uh, well, color. see, this, this I give you people an idea of uh, of wet wet sifting. So this is a piece that's dry, right? Yes. Yes. And you can see it's been cleaned, but even if it wouldn't, if it wasn't cleaned, this might be more difficult to see. But let's look what happens when it's wet. That's right. That's right. That's very attractive pottery. That's very very colorful. Yes. And they would sometimes okay. put glaze on them on the outside as well. That some of those wears off over time. Now the other thing to remember is that when you're when you're digging and you've got um, small shards of pottery, you end up with little pieces that may have some markings on it. You can't see when they're dirty. So that's why we do the wet sifting and uh, wash our pottery uh, every night. So that, that stuff can show up beautiful. And I love the colors. Well, you know, nice, can, like, nice examples of bichrome wear. Yeah, well, thank you. So we just, and this is a rare occasion, people. You should do, enjoy this. The actual pottery. Usually goes, you're just going to see pictures and that's it. And you're lucky if they're in color. They're going to show you bichrome pottery in black and white. Is that fair? <laughs> <laughs> Got to show the color. Yeah, but here, here we go. We're trying to spoil you people. So we're talking about Jericho, bichrome pottery, while it was why it is important because uh, uh you in this case it was um Bryant Wood that was pointing out the late bronze age pottery being bichrome. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And also when I was at the British Museum, there was a display there in Ash and the Ashmolean Museum in, in Oxford, where there's a display of pottery from Jericho. Uh, where you can see the bichrome ware that uh, Kenyon had excavated. So it is on display, and so it is documented. I've witnessed it myself, as well as uh, Bryant Wood. So uh, okay. that's what she ignored in dating, using it to date. She was doing her dating based on the other uh, Mycenaean ware that uh, she said she didn't find. So. Uh, based your conclusions okay. on the absence okay. of evidence, which is something you should never do. So uh, that's why I'm, I'm a bit skeptical of, of Kenyon's conclusions. And uh, in Lorenzo Nigro's research, uh, but he sort of avoided the uh, a lot from that time period. Well, I'll, I'll try to read his report right here in all fairness to yeah. Uh, to everybody. So we're going to get both opinions because right now I think we're we're very we're being maximalist at the moment. But I'm going to take the devil's advocate if I can. Now, once again, what I haven't seen here that would help out a lot are lamps. 
and I haven't seen but maybe one lamp in all these photos. Yeah. Um, of course, we've seen a picture of two tombs. You showed us a Middle Bronze Age tomb. No, wait a second. You showed us a picture of a Middle Bronze Age tomb that was recreated in the British Museum. Yes. But then you showed us scarabs that came from a tomb, and they were 18th Dynasty pharaohs, like Thutmosis III, uh, Hatshepsut. Yes. But one thing, scarabs can be reused. And this argument's always going to come up because they can be yes. used as amulets for a long, long time. So can we just date it to the early part of the late Bronze Age, 1550 or 14, what would we say, 1450 to make it fit the Exodus, the early date? Or was it much later that they were used, you know, as amulets well into the late Bronze Age 2B? So now we have the time period to say of the 13th century, all fairness, right? Because yep. this is the argument. This is the argument. Um, let's go look at the, uh, let me get this out of the way. So I don't, but what we can break. say, what we can say with these is that it can't be earlier. So the pharaohs didn't yeah. exist earlier. So we know exactly well, it has to be from well, a particular date onward, but not backwards. And then we can say with the wall fell outward, well, if I was going to be a maximalist, I could say, oh, that's 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 where they blew the trumpets. But if I want to be not even a minimalist, I could well, I could be in the middle of it and say, that's just an earthquake, folks. Well, the wall fell out because it's an earthquake. Well, George, the it's earthquake a, the earthquake is really irrelevant because it it actually could uh, it could be a, applied to both arguments. That's why I'm using they, it for they blew the They blew the trumpet at the same time that the earthquake happened. Oh, brother. <laughs> that's my take on it, honestly. That's, that's okay. I didn't think of that angle, though. I was thinking one or the other. They blew the trumpets and the wall no, fell. It it's both the same direction. But the also, miracle, what do you think the wall do? Go ahead. The miracle is the timing of the earthquake. That's the miracle. I understand what you're going, and and I want people to understand that too, because he's pushing more for a maximus. This is the way it happened, like the Bible went, and I'm going for like kind of more like an can I say academic? Just academic. I'm not looking at the Bible now. I'm saying that's an earthquake, and the, George, the Hebrews might have. As what? an academic, you can't ignore the ancient text. So that's I can't if I, I don't care about I can't <laughs> if I don't care about the scriptural narrative. Because how many of these? I'm going to read Lorenzo Nigro, all right? Yeah. And I told, didn't I tell you before I went this? I'm going to be the devil's advocate. And that means that as just an academic, that doesn't mean I have to be a Jew or a Christian. I can be an atheist as an academic because as a, what we call biblical archaeology, doesn't mean that somebody has to be a Christian or Jew to be an archaeologist at the site. I think sometimes people think that's the case. You know, but well, anyway, go well, ahead. Bill Deaver, the uh, archaeologist, uh, was on a, on a radio program for the B CBC here in Canada, um, and I was talking about some of the research we were going to be doing with uh, Ararat, Noah's Ark, and then uh, Bill Deaver gets on the on the program. They they invited him in after I spoke, after I recorded my my bit. And he says, David's trying to prove the Bible. No archaeologist takes the, the uh, trowel in one hand and a Bible in the other. And my response to that is no responsible archaeologist takes the trowel in one hand without the Bible in the other hand because it's an ancient text and it's something we need to uh, we need to look at as we look at, you know, the Amarna tablets or any of the other um, ancient primary sources. So, uh, and even Deaver uses the Bible in his research. So he was really in, disingenuous in his comment there uh, to me about using the, the use of the Bible. So it need, both need to be used um, as documents. And we need to be careful on both sides not to try and force our, our evidence into making our arguments. Well, well, right now I'm going to be an advocate for Bill Deaver. <laughs> Not a problem. 
Go for it. Oh, come on. <laughs> You're going to be reading oh, the bio. Okay, this is okay. This is Lorenzo Niagara, and I'm going to try to read this. So, and but I'm not going to go into where he's he's got his uh, what do you call it? the receipts? That's going to make it to where he gets this, like Garstang page. 100, 1930, that's going to make this too difficult. Yeah. Uh, it starts off, it says, Jericho in the late Bronze Age, 1550 to 1200 BC. In the city of Jericho, uh, the city of Jericho was still occupied in the late Bronze Age, although it is reduced in scale. The burnt and collapsed Middle Bronze Age three defense system was refurbished by adding mud brick walls on top of the surviving crest of the cyclopedic walls. So in other words, the big round stones from the Middle Bronze Age are still there, and the Late Bronze Age citizens built their mud brick walls on top of it. That's what it's saying. The palace was scaled to a residency called the Middle Building. Okay, While there was no evidence concerning the temple, Okay. The most notable finds of this period are two royal signet rings bearing the insignia of Amenhotep III, 1390 to 1352 BC, okay, 18th dynasty, and the ceramic assemblage. Let me see where this goes. From tomb five, excavated by Garstein. The most complete absence, the most complete absence of any reference to Jericho in the Armana letter contrast with the discovery by Garstang of a of an administrative tablet dating to the same period. In other words, they actually found a cuneiform tablet, kind of like the El Armana tablets, which is a substantial uh, substantial piece of evidence in favor of the existence of a palace and a city during the 14th century. So far, you're liking this, right? Well. <laughs> okay, love to say, I'm just reading it. In the following stage of LB2B, the site was still occupied in spite of the claim and lack of Mycenaean pottery, which led Garstake to conclude that the city had been abandoned. The absence of Mycenaean pottery, okay, something like this. The absence of the Mycenaean pottery in an inland center may not be chronologically meaning. In other, in other words, it might that type of pottery might not make it make it that far in shore, you know, away from the coast. Moreover, as on the eastern flank in Spring Hill, Kenyon uncovered dwellings dating to uh, to this period. So LB, LB2B. And it seems clear that the middle building was still in use. LB2B layers were heavily cut by leveling operations carried out. Okay, LB2B. So now we're at... Mm, 1300 to 1200 BC, LB2B, LB2A is 1400 to 13, and 1300 for B is 1300 to 12, something like that. Well, that depends on whose dating system you're using, because they have different dating systems. That's the other confusing part. All right. I, I'm not, let, I'm just thinking generally, I think that's how it went last yeah. time I checked, but yeah, we're right. doing the best we can with this. Like we said, Jericho is, is difficult. And I think because even if I don't recognize the Bible, let's say as an academic, an atheist academic, I'll make it, I'll go to the extreme, an atheist academic uh, excavating at Jericho. All right. What gives Jericho its importance is still the biblical narrative. Yes. If it wasn't for the biblical narrative, I don't think people would care. It would just be another site with a lot of cool artifacts and tombs. Yeah. But why all the argument? Why and the Bible? The, and the Bible said it existed. And the Bible said it was destroyed, and the evidence shows it was destroyed as the Bible described. What is the and date? The iron, according to you, but I'm still I'm still the atheist at this point. You know. Let me. I don't know what Lorenzo Negro is. I never. Did, I did, 
I would suspect, I would suspect he, if he is of any faith, it's by tradition only. And, and I suppose he's maybe a, an agnostic or atheist. That's what I would think. And according to how I read the article later on, okay, in the Iron Age, and this explains the scarcity of the 13th century material. Why? Because the late Bronze Age people built on Middle Bronze Age with mud brick and that mid, middle brud, middle <laughs> that late Bronze Age mud brick has eroded or has been taken away for soil, for reuse. MB2 layers were also detected on the southern and eastern flank of the tell. Expeditions in the areas. Now, this won't mean anything to us right now. Areas A, E, and T. Uh, as well as the northwest, the overall stratigraphy of Tel El Sultan, that's Jericho, Tel El Sultan, through time may explain why late Bronze Age layers were mostly preserved all around the Tel flanks. That means around the edges, but were mostly completely cut away from its top by the Iron Age Roman Hellenistic and built Byzantine building activities. Why? They're saying that Iron Age Roman Hellenistics and Romans used remains of ancient Jericho for their own structures and their own use. That's why most of it's gone from the top center, but the peripheral flanks remained. That's what he's saying. They remained. Why? I don't know. They just didn't bother tearing those down. Okay. The Bible account. Here we go. He does mention the Bible. The yep. biblical account of Joshua and archaeology at Tel El Salton. Dun, dun, dun. We need some background music. Dun, dun, dun. Tel El Salton is a protagonist in one of the most famous accounts of the Old Testament. The first major episode of the narrative, the conquest of Canaan by the Israelite tribes under the guidance of the chieftain Joshua, Joshua 2.6. As with any literary narrative, the biblical text has its internal chronology, which fixes Joshua around 1480 BC. If that's the case, he's going with an early date. Which, now this is confusing, 480 years before David. Okay, early date, and he's using it for to David about 1000 BC. This, of course is an exegetic issue and not an archaeological or historical one. So now he just threw that at the Bible, the biblical narrative. That's the Bible, not academic archaeology. That's, that's kind of... Just, yeah, that's just that's myth, just, not worth... It's just all... There you go. You, yeah. So yeah, that's thanks. You said it better than me. In other words, he just called it a fable. Yeah. It's a fable from the Bible, but let me tell you about real archaeology. Okay. okay. It's a bit like what, what we hear. Of, what's like that? We hear, it's like what we hear in the news these days. You know, everything's misinformation except for uh, the news broadcast and what they're saying. That's the truth. You know, we have to accept that as the from the experts. Uh, hey. I'm not buying it. <laughs> hey, so right now you're calling me CNN or something? <laughs> there you go. No, I'm calling oh, him CNN. <laughs> okay, whatever. W. F. Albright, who wanted it to to. He wanted to let biblical stories play on a real historical stage through that Joshua, Joshua's account might better fit the scenario of 13 to the 12th century BC Palestine. Now, what he meant by saying 13th to 12th century, he's saying that Albright was fixing it towards the late date, 1260 BC. You really got to pay attention to what these guys are saying. Yeah. Exactly corresponding to a major occupational gap at the site, according to Kenyon. Okay, I got to flip the screen here. Well, and we found Let's a major, see. we found a major occupational gap called the Late Bronze Gap at Tel uh -huh. as well. So it seems that whatever took out Hamam also took out Jericho. Um, so we have this whole. Um, uh, destruction by the air burst over the Jordan Valley at that time period. Uh, we seem to see the same thing over at uh, at Hamam as, or at uh, Jericho as we did at Hamam. So and that would be that would be reasonable. 
Um, again, okay. the dating just is all over the place, depending on who you talk so, to. So you're saying you both had gaps. He's saying he's got some of a gap here, but let's see what else he says. This was seen as a problem, but he just used up like a past tense word was. This was seen as a problem by those thinking that the biblical account should have, should have had a literal archaeological correspondence influencing in turn several scholarly discussions. And it's got a little, all these books are quoted. As excavations started at Tel El Salden, this became a tantalizing question debate, both in archaeology, also in biblical studies. But though it is now accepted that this perspective is, you're going to love this word, mythological, erroneous. Yeah. <laughs> it nevertheless deserves some comment. So he's going to make a comment. Here we go. As a basic premise, one should remember that archaeology really succeeds in matching written sources and excavating evidence. Only the retrieval of extraordinarily well stratified ins inscribed items may allow such a positive correlation. And there are many cases where this has not been enough to achieve a reliable historical reconstruction. So he's talking about things like ostracon, writing on pottery, something that's giving a definite time. And there are many cases where this has not been enough to achieve to achieve a reasonable historical reconstruction. We read that. In many cases, the ruins of Tel Salt include massive uh, collapse and burnt mud brick structures. One may imagine that the terrible destruction suffered by the Canaanite cities both in the 3rd and 2nd millennium BC, have surely become part of a local shared memory and possibly were narrated as the, I never heard this word before, possibly, okay, narrated as a Jerichoans, Jerichoans, people that live in Jericho are Jerichoans, okay. The Jerichoans had been able to overcome them almost every time. Okay, so what he's saying is the people that remained, the descendants that remained at Jericho, those that inhabited, looked at past ruins, and they're making reasons for it, why what this happened. So it's part of their hmm, tradition. Uh, there is no way, however, to link them directly to the Bible, except for the fact that the biblical author may have reused one of these stories to validate the historicity of his narrative. The ruins of Tel El Sultan are far older than, than the alleged date of Joshua's conquest. Moreover, if we consider the time when the biblical text was written, 6th century B.C., or that when it was orally transmitted, 12th to 7th century BC, as well as as well as the long story of its written trans transposition, it is clear how hazardous is is any how hazardous is any attempt to seriously identify something on the ground with biblical personage and their acts. Nonetheless, the already famous ruins of Jericho were exploited by the biblical author, giving them everlasting fame in the story. I'm sorry, people, I chopped it up, but it's really, really tiny. I did my best well, uh, to kind of break he, it down. He just exposed his uh, anti-biblical bias and his interpretation of the data according to his own bias rather than... Uh, as a as a as a middle a maximus would do um, the same kind of thing. So we have a minimalist here, you know, explaining his his findings in accordance to his uh, own perceived uh, bias and presuppositions um, and view about the text. Even even the, the dating of the text when it was written, um, you know, that's that's a clear sign of. They say that the biblical text was written. 
way, way, way after the exile. And uh, conservative Christians say that it was written uh, much earlier. Mm. Uh, if we ever do one on the uh, the Babylonian Chronicles, we can give some evidence. Uh, the name of Belshazzar oh, yeah. and how the uh, early date of the writing of the text is is found evident there as well. So again, um, interesting that uh, you know he he interprets things according to his his own uh, bias. Uh, he's he's put all of his cards on the table and shown his his bias. Uh, my bias, of course, is I I accept that biblical text as being accurate, whether it's early date or late date. Um, that can be debated, but uh, that's well, the they, lens. It, that's the lens through which he's interpreting his findings. Um, well, sure, but that's to be expected, right? Uh, I mean, just the same way that Garstang interpreted things according to his lens um, at the time, yeah. and Brian so, Wood is interpreting things through his lens. But again, there's disagreement, and uh, it continues. Uh, I just wish that Lorenzo Nigro would let. Uh, some of the conservative folk dig on his site, but he's banned them from doing that. So that, uh, and I know that story. So um, biases. Have you been Have you been banned from the site? Uh, as a volunteer. Oh. <laughs> well, you know, I, I don't think that would hurt being banned as a volunteer. I'd be. I mean, it, it hurt me if I, if I was getting paid and all of a sudden I couldn't work there and not get paid. Well, it's you, kind of there's no surprise uh, that what I read about we knew this was coming, right? Yeah. We know what. You're well, it's say. important to have somebody look over their shoulders to make sure that they're they're actually digging stuff up properly and and documented accordingly. We have the same same issue over at Tell a Mom, uh, so we bring in people like uh, oh, uh, who do we have on our site? Yeah, Bob Mullins over there, and you had uh, before you was there uh, well, Maltzberger, David Maltzberger. Yeah, Maltzberger, but Mullins has never been to our site. Okay, he's only, he's only done the pottery reading in Albuquerque, uh, but no, we had all their uh, other folk. We had um, um, what's uh, Herschel Shanks, and uh, oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah, we had Herschel on the site. And he didn't believe it at first until he got there and saw what was going on and um, the evidence that was before him. So I would like to have just been able to uh, see what uh, confirm um, the actual pottery discoveries. I don't take anybody's word for anything anymore. <laughs> Too many biases. Well, that's that's true. You got to be in there, but you got to learn somewhere. Yep. You know, you might start. You know, it depends who, what school you go to. You might start learning them when you get on your own a little bit. You might change your mind. Yeah. But that was no surprise reading that, you know, and I appreciate, of course, Lorenzo Niagara's report. I mean, it is interesting. It yeah. is what it is. There's nothing surprising about it. Like we said, there's a reason why we say maximalist and minimalist because they both exist. <laughs> they do. And they're, uh... but it's up to the, our listening audience to, to do their own studying because this is accessed on the web. That's how I got it. Yeah. But if they got to determine what is nonsense. <laughs> That's this right. is my nonsense. Let's see. Does that make sense? Uh, George. Yeah. We'll have none of that. None of that. None of that. <laughs> I got to find the evil nun. This is a nice nun. I got to find that evil nun from that, that exorcist movie. <laughs> yeah, David. So, but don't 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 give me any of that maximalistic nonsense now. Mm -mm. So I just read Lorenzo. Take yeah, that. We'll, take, we'll take, have none take, of that. that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the the takeaway for our listening audience is that um, you know archaeology is difficult, and um, your biases do color the way you interpret your your data. And so uh, there is no such thing as uh, neutrality. Nobody's neutral. And so you need to take those biases into consideration when you're reading the material, uh, when you're reading the reports, uh, when you're reading my books. And, um, you know, the pottery is the pottery, uh, but the dating might be off. 
and uh, we need to be careful about that. So let's go over what we learned today. This is late Bronze Age, two colors, bichrome, right? That's right. And this is late Bronze Age, Mycenaean ware. Yes. Okay. But this is another Canaanite form, so it's imitation made locally, both from the late Bronze Age. And then we also have the Cypriot Bilbil. Yes. Also from the late Bronze Age. That's in the, all indicators. And then we had the, remember what this was called? Kind of fun. A fun name. That's chocolate on chocolate. white whiteware. Yeah, brown yeah. on white, yeah. Brown on chocolate on white. I tasted it. It's, that tastes like chocolate. I don't know why they call it that. I'm confused. Right? <laughs> so we, we learned something today. You got to see actual fun pottery. And a good discussion, nice PowerPoint that kind of like brings us into the thought pattern of what's going on at the excavation of uh, uh, Jericho, yeah. starting with uh, Garstang. Well, before Garstang, and then you had that German team, was it Seller? And yeah. then you had Garstang, that's the 1930s. And then Kenneth uh, Kenyon, uh, Dane, Dane. Uh, yeah. Kenyon, she, uh, of course, that's like late 1950s, early 1960s. Yeah. And so I just. And that's, that's when the fire hit the fan because that's when she said, no, he was wrong. Yeah. Well, that's what we have. We have a, a basically a chronology of the, of the controversy and why Jericho is so controversial. So that's the takeaway. Uh, folks can continue to read and do the research. And, uh, you know, as, as more and more stuff is published, uh, people will continue to interpret the data and uh, put their biases in there and their own conclusions. But uh, they, they, they think they get, if like you have a maximalist and a minimalist at a dig site together, they get mad and it's like, give me back my spade. Give me back my shovel. You can't use my spade no more. <laughs> well, that's when they start throwing pottery at each other, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how we get fragments. That's how you get shards. They're whole intact pieces until these guys quit. They don't, they start their disagreeing. Then they start throwing stuff at each other. Like, oh, this is just a mess. Just a mess. Yeah. I must say that at Tell Al-Hamam, we've had, we've had a full spectrum of individuals working with us as volunteers. I uh, had a Catholic priest working with me. Uh, and we had uh, atheists. Uh, we've had Christians. Uh, we've had some that are just, you know, of no opinion at all. Uh, we have some maximalists and minimalists, so you got a full mixture there, and uh, so it's, it's good to keep you keep you in check. And but uh, you know the pottery is the pottery, and you know you, you, everybody, whether they're whatever their background is, got to wash the pottery and got to document the pottery. So the scientific method doesn't change; it's the interpretation that sometimes gets in the way, and um, everybody's got to keep an open mind at least and try and wade right. through the data. So thanks for reading that material from uh, Lorenzo Nigro. I've um, I've not dealt with a lot of that recently. It's just getting to my age. I, I read that just for you and your heart medicine. Yeah. yeah. I'm a big boy. <laughs> I've heard worse. I already, I already took my blood pressure medicine, so nothing bothers me now. I'm good. I've heard, I've heard worse. So it's... Uh, but he threw, hey, he threw a lot at us. That's people. That was a lot of both sides of the spectrum. I think got represented today. And if you paid attention, he talks about also. Uh, and I, I recommend that people go get that article and read it for themselves to get a hang on how archaeologists talk in the articles. And then you got to really reason why. Like, what what did they mean by that? Because we went through different periods of the late like late Bronze Age too. So by two, I meant T-O-O -O also. You had the, the late Bronze Age of 1446, that being represented of the early date. And then he mentioned, I think it was, I forget who he mentioned, but was the late date of the Exodus, which he mentioned 13th century. So he's talking about the time period of Ramses, the let my people go. You got to like the movie, even if you don't believe, right? Let yeah. my people go. And then... uh the idea of cyclopedic walls, middle bronze cyclopedic walls. 
And late bronze mud brick walls built on top of that. So you got to kind of picture in your mind. But if you get the article, there's pictures, just like David. Uh, he, he has lots of pictures, and there's pictures in there to help explain what he's talking about. And he waits, he waits at the very end to throw the snowballs. <laughs> yeah. You knew it's coming. Well, you know how complicated you know how What's complicated that? the issue is for Jericho is, is what the take home yeah. is. People see how right. it is complicated and um and it's not settled. And uh, people need to keep an open mind, um, but th they get a little bit of the history of how uh, how we got here, um, and people's got to pay pay their money and take their choice. <laughs> Hopefully, it's been helpful. Well, yeah, I think people can understand uh, if there's a bias that you got to understand how other people think. In in, in all fairness, hey, I don't know about you guys up in Canada, but we try to have our freedom of speech, and that's part of it, isn't it? You got to deal with it. And uh, but anyway, hey, off the subject. And uh, you know, somebody tried to take another shot at Trump the other day. How's that work? I didn't know that. And then some. And then I got on the news and found out that. Yeah, yesterday. Yeah, yesterday. Yeah. I don't know if that's ever happened in American history for presidents. It's two attempts on the, the same president. I don't know if that's ever been um, done before. Yeah. So, yeah. So inter stuff. interesting times, totally inter interesting times we're living in right now, you know? So if anything bad happens, just remember I'm hiding behind very fragile pottery, so don't hurt me. <laughs> All right, David, thank you for your time. That's a, uh, you know, that was going to be an interesting, uh, this is going to be a lot of fun. Jericho is a lot of fun. Uh, a lot of feuding, you know, when it gets down to it, eh, about the dates, about the carbon-14 dating. Everything's going to be an issue with Jericho. And the avoidance. I like how kind of like he really didn't talk a lot about late Bronze Age. That was, I know it took me a while to read it, but that was like only one paragraph. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like one little, not even a chapter. I shouldn't say paragraph. It was more like four or five paragraphs. But that's not a lot because I can imagine this poor guy, he's giving a two-hour lecture, right? And his lecture is done. Somebody's going to raise up their hand. What's the first question they're going to ask? Have when you found Joshua or something like that? I bet she just gets absolutely sick and tired of, the, you know, out of all these time he spends and, in in, you know, the complexity of Jericho. And when your lecture is done, you know, that's what you're going to be hit with, number one. And it reminds me of uh, the late uh, Amnon Ventura. He would do lectures on hot sore. Every lecture I was at, usually with a BAR, Biblical Archaeological Review, mm -hmm. after his lecture, somebody would raise up their hand, and what would they ask? Did it, Have you found the archives? Yeah. Have you found the archives? They were looking for more tablets. I remember one quote by Ben Tor and uh, when he was digging and of course Finkelstein Israel Finkelstein was digging at Megiddo and mm -hmm. uh, Alan Ben Tor was digging at at that time. Oh, I forget the site. Anyway it might have been it might have been Megiddo as well but anyway he said he says I don't care what Israel Finkelstein says the Israelites were here. <laughs> and I guess that's my response to our, our whole thing today. I don't care what everybody says and what uh, the Israelites were there at Jericho. <laughs> and they took the city. Whatever the date was, they took it. And there's evidence of that. Uh, so you just have to, you just have to uh, ignore the date. That they're all trying to fight over. And just okay. Yeah. This is fun. Yeah. But uh, it is complicated. And everybody that this has been one of the wow, uh, it's it's been a different lecture for Jericho. But there's there's stuff out there on the web, also on YouTube. A number of uh, I say all of it's really good. It's from different perspectives, but it's still fun. Uh I know there's a few of them out there by 
uh, Professor uh, Nigro, Lorenzo Nigro. That's the guy that I was quoting. And he's got a heavy accent. I think he's Italian. He's Italian. Uh, but, yeah, so his, uh, but also his work is, is can be accessed and put on a PDF file. And if you want Dr. Graves' material, well, then we got lots of books. Yes. Yeah, I deal with and, the, uh, I deal with those earlier uh, in two of my books. I deal with the, um, the archaeology part in my archaeology of the Old Testament. I have a section on Jericho. And then in my history of biblical archaeology, um, I talk about the, uh, the individuals that uh, mm -hmm. we mentioned today, their, their backgrounds and their history and, and some of the, some of the controversy that's there. So I, I don't claim to be able to solve the, the issue. I don't, nobody is able to, but uh, I can give you a little bit of the background and, and why it is such a controversial site and the reasons for that. Hopefully right. we've exposed those today. Yes, we exposed Jericho, but we try not to expose ourselves. <laughs> All right. You froze uh, up, George. Well, I didn't hear you. You froze up. Oh, really? I, okay, well, I'm sorry. Did I lose the microphone on you right there? I said we, we exposed Jericho, but we did not expose ourselves. I figured that's what you were going for. No, it, it, <laughs> uh, it just completely froze up and uh, froze you in space. Well, that's why we don't do things live. and We edit this. Yeah. That way we look, we look better. Yeah. Good, George. Good to be with you again, as always. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Everybody, thanks for attending. Don't forget to subscribe. And uh, for all those that have sub subscribed, thank you very much um, for helping us attain that 100,000 subscriber platform we're at right now. But we're not going to stop there. We're going to keep on going at it. Until then, you have a good day. Doctor, also, you have a good day.